It's my pleasure today to introduce to you Pastor Roger Roberts. Pastor Roger has most recently been in the mission field in Brussels. And you know how they say if you go six people deep that you'll find a connection someplace? Well, Pastor Roger has had the opportunity to minister with an old friend of ours, Pastor Robert Marsh, you guys might remember him, um, in the international mission field. As a matter of fact, um, Roger shared with me that um, Bob couldn't resist at one of their um, praise gatherings to play the drums. That doesn't sound like Bob at all, does it? <laughs> but anyway, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through your bio because you're going to do a lot better job of it than I am. So, Pastor Roberts, please yeah. come up. It was our pleasure to meet Bob and Carol on a couple of occasions, uh, International Baptist uh, Convention of Churches, uh, churches from all over Europe. Really now it's worldwide. Um, but we have gatherings. We had gatherings uh, that we used to go to every year. And um, so those were occasions when we uh, met Bob and Carol. And of course, I've continued to follow his good work there in Darmstadt, um, as he is planning a church there, just as he planted a church here. And um, it seems like God is giving him people and uh, resources. And uh, so they're doing what God has called them to do and doing a faithful and effective job with it. So certainly we want to continue to pray for him. And I'm sure this church family means a lot to him and Carol. Yeah, it's been a really tough week, hasn't it? Um, things in the news that are just unbelievable. Um, and uh, yet, as we know, the Lord himself is on the throne and he is able to uh, bring good out of tragedy. So we need to pray. Uh, one of the uh, interesting things that I found out about uh, the bombing in Boston. Do uh, you know about the young girl, uh, graduate student there at the University, Boston University, who was one of the three killed at the, uh, the bombing site? A uh, Chinese girl. And uh, we've become acquainted with some intervarsity uh, workers there in Madison, uh, become friends of theirs. And intervarsity, you know, has a, a worldwide student ministry. Uh, where they share the gospel on campus and make disciples on campus. And they reach out to unconverted, uh, not yet Christian uh, students. And uh, this Chinese girl, uh, I was told by this friend of ours, uh, attended a, a retreat, um, a gospel, a, a, a intervarsity retreat with the purpose of sharing the gospel. And this Chinese girl uh, showed an interest in becoming a Christian. And uh, we can only hope and pray um, that uh, she did come to know Christ uh, before her life was taken in that Boston bombing uh, tragedy. Uh, horrible experience. So we do uh, look to the Lord for his grace and we pray that God will turn triumph uh, out of tragedy, uh, move in the hearts and lives of those people that grieve and that suffer there in Boston and of course in West little town of West Texas, uh, the horrible experience there uh, that took so many lives there in the explosion of that fertilizer plant. So many reasons for us uh, to be in prayer for God to work through the power of the Holy Spirit. As I've talked with your elders about ministry to you, um, I talked particularly with Jim about what part of the scriptures would be helpful to you. And of course, it's, it's hard to narrow it down because all of the scriptures are helpful and useful to us. Um, but in the light of your circumstances, in the light of your situation, uh, what is it that God can say to us that will encourage, that will strengthen, that will help motivation? Um, and I suggested to Jim that the little letter of First John, John's first letter, uh, just can't be beat uh, in covering all the bases that we need to cover uh, for several reasons. Uh, first of all, in our motivation uh, to be faithful disciples and followers of Jesus. And then in our examination of our relationship with God. Uh, so turn your Bibles to 1 John, not the Gospel of John. Uh, John 
was one of the disciples, you know, he had a brother named James. They were called, nicknamed the Sons of Thunder. Um, but, but John uh, was an, also known as the beloved disciple. He seemed to have a very special, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ and got that name as the beloved disciple. And he liked to call himself that, uh, the disciple that Jesus especially loved. And John wrote the gospel, a great gospel, one of the four gospels of the New Testament, but he also wrote uh, these letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Toward the end of your New Testament, I think then they're followed by Jude and then Revelation. So it's almost at the very end of your, of your Bible is the first letter of John. Uh, John is writing this letter to encourage the church, a church that uh, had been uh, attacked by false doctrine, false teaching, uh, that was disturbing the faith of many people, that was scattering the fellowship of the church, that was discouraging the faith of God's people. And so John is writing a letter to encourage uh, these people uh, to stand up against this false teaching, uh, these people who are called uh, Gnostics. They, they taught that, uh, uh, that Jesus really wasn't fully God and fully man. Um, so they denied the full deity and the full humanity of Jesus, which is a precious doctrine. We, we must believe that God uh, emptied himself, but he remained fully God in Jesus Christ. Um, and that he was also fully man in the flesh. Uh, he suffered physically for us on the cross. Uh, he physically rose again. But also, he is the God we worship, the eternal Son of God, with the Father from all eternity, and then became man for us, lived and died for us. Well, the false teachers were trying to confuse people and say that's not really true. And as a result, they were also teaching immorality. They were saying, if you have your spiritual life in good condition, you can do anything you want to do in the flesh. Uh, in other words, if you, if you can get this secret knowledge, this secret instruction, and get smart like we are, these false teachers are saying, you can do anything you want to, uh, because the soul is separate from the body. And this was part of this Greek philosophy. And so they were actually encouraging immorality. And not only that, it was bringing about a loss of love and trust for one another. So what, what John is saying to them, you are being attacked at the very essentials of your Christian life. And the way you can know and have assurance that you are the children of God is to examine yourself in three categories. First, do you have the right belief? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God? In other words, you've got to have right belief against false teaching. Secondly, do you have the right behavior? Are you living like truly converted people? Your heart's been changed. Uh, you love God, you love others, but also you want to live a holy and righteous life. And it is important that our bodies be temples of the Holy Spirit because the Spirit fully dwells us. There's no separation between body and spirit and soul. So right behavior. Thirdly, do you have the right love for each other? Because love is at the very heart of the Christian faith. And if you don't have love, then you're like these false teachers. You've been deceived. You are self-deceived, and you need to take check, examine yourself to make sure you're really in the faith as eternal children of God. So he gives these tests, but he begins the letter, before he gets into the testing part, he begins with an introduction. John is good at writing introductions. I love his introduction to his gospel, which we call the prologue, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. But here's also a good introduction. The first four verses are 1 John. It's even printed in your bulletin there if you don't have your Bible with you. And I'll read from the scriptures where he gives an introduction describing not only his motivation for writing the letter, but the motivation we should have as disciples. And so what he describes in these first four verses is a motivated disciple. And that's what we all want to be. And maybe today you need to have a motivation check. And see, am I really motivated now, not only to hear Roger preach for the next few months, not only to keep coming to worship here at Gateway Community Church, but am I motivated, really stirred to action, to be a faithful disciple of Jesus? So notice these important verses. John begins by saying, That which was from the beginning, 
That which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes. Now, who is he talking about here? He's talking about Jesus, the eternal word, the eternal son of God. We've seen with our eyes, which we have looked at. Our hands have touched. We've been with Jesus in his physical presence. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. John also calls Jesus the word in his introduction to the gospel. The word of life. Verse 2. The life appeared, and we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. A motivated disciple. Just like a motivated athlete. I was interested, uh, you know, everything we know nowadays is found on the internet. Well, I, I read some things about Mayville on the internet. And I discovered you are a very sports-minded town. Particularly in your high school. Uh, your rivalry over here, Horicon. What is it, the, uh, the Marsh? Marshman. Marsh Bowl. Yeah, okay. You, you, you have a big football rivalry. You have a good baseball team. In fact, uh, I was talking with a, an acquaintance I've made at the fitness center where I go do exercising near where we live. And I told him I was going to be preaching here in Mayville. He said, Roger, you'll do well with those people because like you, they're sports-minded. Sports-minded people. And sports-minded people know the importance of motivation. In fact, I was reading not too long ago about a very successful college football coach who said, you cannot win unless your players are motivated. They can be the best, most gifted, capable, strongest, fastest athletes anywhere. But if they don't have the right motivation, you can't win. You just can't win. And the same is true in the Christian life. If we don't have the right kind of motivation, we cannot be really faithful and effective disciples and followers of Jesus Christ. So we need to join John and have some kind of a motivation check. Looking into our hearts. What is it that caused you to get up this morning and come here to worship with your fellow believers? What is it that will cause you to leave this place to go out into the community where you live, where you work, where you go to school, to have concern for others, a desire to share with others, and a desire to continue to worship Christ in your daily life, in your daily experience. Now notice, a motivated disciple, first of all, is convinced about the reality of Christ. And this is what John is describing in these verses of Scripture. He's talking about the deep reality of Jesus Christ. Listen, we don't worship a phantom. We don't worship a philosophy. The Gnostic false teachers, they were all caught up in their philosophy. They thought it was all intellectual understanding and you had to have this sort of a elite brain that could comprehend their unique philosophy. No, we don't worship a philosophy. We worship a person, the reality of Jesus Christ, which John describes in his gospel, of course giving us the real life of Jesus Christ who was born of the Virgin and who lived there in an obscure village there in the Holy Land as we call it today. Jesus of Nazareth who performed miracles, who called other disciples that he taught and prepared to be his followers, who claimed some amazing things and John records some of these in his gospel, where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Heavenly Father except through me. I am the resurrection and the life, is what he said as he was getting ready to raise Lazarus from the dead. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd of the sheep, and my sheep hear my voice and are drawn to me. I am. And he told his enemies who were criticizing him for making these great claims, you haven't heard anything yet, Jesus said. I am. Before Abraham was, I am. What Jesus was saying there in John chapter 8 is, I am the eternal Son of God. I am the one who introduced himself to Moses at the burning bush. When Moses said, who are you? What is your name? 
I am, Yahweh, Jehovah. And Jesus said, I am the eternal Son of God. And so John says, we knew him. We lived with him. We saw him. We were in his presence. We rubbed shoulders with him, the eternal Son of God. And then his death and his resurrection, not only his life, but John says, I'm convinced that he had a very special purpose. And that was his death for us. Can you imagine? Now, the disciples had a hard time understanding that. They really did. Um, because they were Jews. And the Jews thought that their Messiah would politically, militarily, deliver them from the oppressors, their enemies, the Romans. And they hoped for this Messiah. And when Jesus began to introduce himself to them and ask them to follow him, well, their first idea was, this is going to be great. You know, nobody knows much about us now, but this man is special. And at the right time, he's going to overthrow these oppressors, these Romans. He's going to assert his miraculous power over them. And we're going to have an immediate kingdom. Everything's going to be great and wonderful. But they didn't understand that he would die and then rise again. You, you know, and you're reading from the Gospels, time and time again, Jesus explained to them, listen, it's not going to be like you think it's going to be. I am going to suffer and die. I'm going to be crucified and then rise again. And they thought, that'll never happen to you. In fact, Peter tried to tell Jesus that wouldn't happen to you. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You have in mind the world's way of thinking, not God's way. And so Jesus died purposefully on a cross, just like he said he would. In John chapter 12, he had this fear of the cross because he knew that it would be not just physical suffering, he would be the curse of God for the sin of the world. He would suffer our punishment for all of our sin. All sinners from all time, of all creation, past, present, and future, our sin would be laid upon Jesus Christ and he would suffer on the cross for us. And so Jesus said, Father, save me from this hour. But no, for this reason, Jesus said, I've come into the world. It's a cross. Jesus came into the world, not just to be a great teacher, not just to do some miracles, and those miracles just helped us to understand who he is. But he came primarily to die. A substitutionary death for us. To die in our place, to pay the penalty that we deserve to pay for our sins, that we might be forgiven. That God justice, God's justice would be served, but he would give us his grace as he would forgive us our sin. In other words, justice is done, but grace is given. We are forgiven, as we sang just a few moments ago. And so John says, if you want to be motivated, first of all, you've got to be convinced about the reality of Christ, that he really lived, that he died, and that what? He rose again. You've got to believe that Jesus lives. Not only that he died on the cross for your sins 2,000 years ago in a real place in Jerusalem, right outside the city walls, but he lives, he rose again, and he is alive today. And so John was convinced of that. And so he said, we looked upon him. And John did look upon Jesus in his resurrection. He was one who went to the tomb with Simon Peter, you know. And he looked and he saw and he believed. And I, I love the way Jesus explained to Doubting Thomas there in John chapter 20. You know, John wasn't with the, the other disciples on Easter, that first Easter when Jesus rose. And so he said, unless I see for myself, I'm not going to believe. And uh, I, I'm going to have to touch his hands. I've got to see those nail prints. I've, I've got to see for myself. And, uh, and then when Jesus appeared the next Sunday, he stood before Thomas and Thomas immediately believed. Jesus said, look, touch, see, see for yourself. My Lord and my God. And Jesus said, blessed are those who haven't seen physically and yet have believed. And you know what I think from that? I think that your experience and my experience with Jesus is just as real as was the experience of these first disciples. And that's what John is saying. We're convinced, we saw with our physical eyes, but really, some people, you can give them all the evidence in the world, and they're not going to believe. 
They're not going to believe. I mean, you can argue till you're blue in the face. And you can give them every reason to believe in Jesus. And they won't believe because they don't have a heart to believe. But when you open your heart and your mind to Christ and the reality of the gospel, you see, not just physically, you see spiritually. You have insight. Not physical sight, but insight that receives the truth of God, that speaks to your heart and mind, convinces you. In other words, we don't see in order to believe. We believe in order to see. See? Some people say, you know, if I can just have enough evidence, I'm looking for God. You know, you know, some people who say they're looking for God are like I'm looking for the flu. You know, I, I'm looking to not get it. Right? I, I'm looking to avoid it. And I think there are a lot of people who say I'm looking for God, hoping to not really meet up with God because then they know their lives will have to change. Their lives, their behavior will have to change, right? And, and so it's just talk. But when you have a heart to see, to believe, then what happens? You see. You understand. It's real. It's true. It's life-changing. And this is exactly what John is saying. Convinced about the reality of Christ and then converted by an experience with Christ. That's what he's saying in verses 2 and 3. The life appeared. We've seen it. We testify. We proclaim. That which was with the Father has appeared to us. We proclaim what we've seen, what we've heard. These are words of experience. These are words of sensory experience. It's, it's real. It's as real as this metal desk right here, this riser. It's just as real as the chair you're sitting on. It's the reality of Jesus Christ himself. Let's see, I, I need to look at a clock. You don't have a clock on the wall. Right over there. Oh, you do have a clock. You can see it, but I can't. <laughs> I, I'll just notice when you get restless. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there was uh, uh, two little boys uh, in the community who were friends, and one little boy was a Catholic. The other little boy was a, a Baptist, evangelical Christian. And, and so the little boys got their parents to, to let them visit each other's church. Uh, and, and the Catholic boy said, you come to my church to Mass with me uh, one Sunday, and the next Sunday I'll come to your Baptist church with you. And so they worked it out of the parents, and so they did that. So the first Sunday they went to the Catholic church. And of course they went into this very formal uh, sanctuary, uh, and they, the little boy saw his friend genuflect, and well, I guess he took some holy water, genuflected, got in, and of course all the intricacies of the Mass, where they stand, where they sit, where they rise, the priest does all this and all that, and he does the incense and, of course, the communion and all this. And so he would repeatedly ask his friend, what does that mean? And the little Catholic boy would say, well, this means uh, this is the blessing of God. Or this means that this is the body of Christ. Or this means this, this means that. And so this was very instructive in the Catholic Church. So the next Sunday they went to the Baptist Church. And so the pastor got up. The first thing he did was take off his watch and put his watch where he could see it on the pulpit. And so the little Catholic boy just turned to his Baptist friend. He said, what does that mean? And the little Baptist boy said, it doesn't mean a thing. <laughs> so I, I take off my watch, but it doesn't mean a thing. It's just formality. It just uh, gives you peace, uh, hope. <laughs> but anyway, no, I'll let you go in time. Uh, yeah. But uh, there, there is this motivation that comes. First of all, in being convinced about the reality of Christ. But then secondly, converted by an experience with Christ that changes your life. It's, it's personal. Again, these, these are words of experience. It reminds me of what David says. Taste and see that the Lord is good. You know, the Christian life is not intellectual. It's physical. It's emotional. Uh, it's, it's sensory. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a totality of life itself. It's something that permeates all of your life. It's not anything that's permeating it. When, when you go to work, you should sense the presence of God there because God is there. And you have a relationship with Him that's real, that's life-changing. And, and look at Paul. Paul, uh, as he writes to the Philippians in chapter 3, he says, Oh, that I might know Him and the power of His resurrection. Now, listen, he was already a Christian. He had been a Christian for a long time when he wrote to the Philippians. But what he's saying is, there's so much more to know about Him. There's so much more to experience about Him. I want to just keep knowing Him more in a deeper, more life-transforming relationship that's real, that's personal, that's close. 
that, that will permeate my whole life, that will become an obsession with me. And so we are converted by an experience with Christ that is truly life-changing. Uh, you know, there are a lot of proofs about the resurrection, for the resurrection in the scripture. You have the empty tomb. Uh, of course, you have the undisturbed grave clothes that could be explained only by a resurrection body that left those grave clothes uh, uh, totally undisturbed. You have the experience of the disciples at the empty tomb. You have that the Jewish opponents had made sure that nobody would steal the body of Jesus, and yet it was gone. And you have so many evidences in the New Testament. Of course, you have the Gospels that give all the accounts of the resurrection. You have the letters of the New Testament that give the accounts of the resurrection. You have church history that tells about the resurrection. You have the growing of Christianity, the growing of churches. But you know, one of the greatest evidences of the reality of the resurrection is what happened to those disciples. Those disciples were totally devastated by the cross. They didn't understand it. It just didn't make sense to them. And then when they saw Jesus crucified, of course they had fled and forsaken him, some came back. They were fearful until they realized Jesus lives. They were defeated, their hopes were lost. Their whole purpose in life that they had taken up to follow Jesus as their Lord, all that was defeated until they saw Jesus. And when they saw Jesus, their lives were transformed. So much in fact that you couldn't stop those disciples from sharing the gospel of Jesus. You couldn't intimidate them anymore. They weren't afraid anymore. In fact, they were willing to suffer and die. Most of the disciples, those original disciples, were martyred. John himself was on exile out on Patmos, and tradition says that he, too, eventually was martyred. And, and yet they were willing to die. You're not willing to die for something you don't believe, something that doesn't really get hold of you and convince you and give you conviction. And so there's this strong, life-changing transformation that takes place. And, and look how John is changed. When Jesus first gets a hold of James and John, they're called the sons of thunder. And, and uh, when Jesus isn't well-received, uh, you remember they, some of the Samaritans wouldn't let him go through their village, and, and John says, let's call down fire and brimstone. Let's destroy him. And here he is, the disciple, the beloved disciple, who talks about love. Man, you're talking about a change. You know, uh, also, toward the cross, remember when James and John put their mother up to going to Jesus? and say, go ask Jesus something. Ask Jesus if we can be in uh, places of power and prominence. One of us on the left, one of them on the right. That means places of power. When, when a king has someone on his right and his left, those are his most trusted advisors. Those are his highest the commanding officers, hey, get Jesus to give us those places of honor. Now this is right before the cross. Ambition, selfish ambition, shameful ambition. But notice, after Christ rose and the Holy Spirit came into their hearts, he changed them. He changed John into a humble, love-centered, God-fearing, humble servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Christ does. He changes character. He changes behavior. He changes your perspective and your outlook because He is with us and He is within us. And all this language in this passage of Scripture really talks about experience. We have seen Him, touched Him, felt, been with Him. And we proclaim what, what's real. Now, I've been to the Holy Land. It's great. The Holy Land for me was inspirational, but it wasn't life-changing. Now there's a difference. You, you know, you can be inspired by church, by worship. You can be inspired by music, but it's not always life-changing. There's a difference. Um, I, I sensed something of the presence of God when I was at, at uh, Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Uh, I, I was really inspired, I guess, when we went out on the Lake Galilee, and realized that Jesus was there with his disciples. They were, we were on the shore by Capernaum, and I realized what Jesus did when he called his disciples and followed him. That, that was inspiring. But you know, the, all the molecules have changed, and, and erosion has taken place. And it's not the same place as it was when Jesus really walked those shores. But Jesus is as real here as he was there. And I've sensed more of the presence of Jesus 
in a hospital room than I did in Jerusalem. I experienced more of the presence of Jesus uh, singing a gospel song or a hymn, uh, having a little time of worship with my wife, uh, calling upon the Lord for his help. I've sensed more of the presence of God in sharing Jesus with somebody and praying along with them as they ask Christ to come into their life and they commit to him as Lord. I, I shared that with an African-American preacher one time. I was um, in college. We had a spiritual emphasis week. And we had a, a preacher from Nashville, Tennessee, African-American, very colorful guy. He was a college president. Charles Body was his name. And I told him that the night before, one of my teammates on the football team had come to my office because he was, had a near-death experience. He was almost hit by a train. He was scared to death. He said, Roger, you're a Christian. Can you help me become a Christian? That didn't happen very often in college. And, and, so, and so we prayed, and, you know, and that was a wonderful experience. It, it thrilled my heart. And, and I told Dr. Body the next day, we had uh, lunch together, and I said, told him about this experience. And he said, you know, I bet you could feel the flapping of angel wings. Now, now let me tell you, I don't know your circumstances and where you are in your life, and you may be not very motivated right now, and maybe you don't feel very close to God. And that happens. That's very normal. We don't always have the same emotional uplift. We don't always have the excitement we should have. We don't always have, we don't always have the assurance and peace that we should have. Sometimes that flees from us. And we need to get back into the presence of God. But let me tell you. You can experience the joy of Christ's presence. And feel the flapping of angel wings. Wherever you are. Wherever you are. Jesus is real. And through the Holy Spirit, He is as present with you. He's actually more present with you. Didn't He say His disciples, it's to your advantage that I go away? Because then I will be in you. He uses that preposition in the Greek. Inside of you. Not just with you. But inside of you. The risen Lord Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit will be inside of you. Even if you don't feel it. Even if you don't think about it. He is always within you. To transform you. To encourage you. To empower you. Uh, so we're concerned now. Okay, we have this life-changing relationship. Now we are concerned to share the message of Christ. Now we're motivated because there is something in us that wants to find expression. That's the last point. Have we gotten there yet? Okay, life-changing. And so now we're concerned to share the message of Christ with clarity and with conviction. You know, um, I have uh, been a pastor for many years. I was ordained, I think, 45 years ago uh, to the gospel ministry when I finished college, got married, went off to seminary. And throughout all these years, I, like Bob did with this church, I planted a church, our first experience, and we pastored churches of all sizes and in all places and locations and in Europe. And let me tell you something. Uh, we've done evangelism training. We had evangelism seminars. And we could get people out because the Baptists always come up with some new program of learning how to share the gospel with people. And we could always get a good crowd if it was a new program. Because I think most people would like to be able to share their faith and know how to introduce somebody else to Jesus. Um, and so we could get people out for an evangelism seminar. And for the first two or three weeks, you know, we'd go out and share Christ with people that had come to our church. We'd go out and talk to people in their homes. We'd always have a pretty good showing for the first two or three weeks. And then, and then after about six weeks, it was back to the same few. I mean, I mean, it's just, all I can tell you, I mean, you just asked me about any one of these programs. They all have their strengths and their weaknesses, but they all finally fizzle out in terms of keeping a lot of people going. Why? It's motivation. Motivation. You know, they, in fact, they even did a, I've lost my watch, uh, they, they even did a, 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 a survey. Uh, one of these evangelism uh, teachers had a survey done. D, D. James Kennedy in Florida had this done. Uh, why do people not share the gospel of Christ? Uh, is it because they're fearful? Is it because uh, they don't, can't learn uh, the verses enough? You know, the main reason was people don't feel like they're good enough. Well, of course, we're never good enough. We're, we're only witnesses. We're only, as one person said, we're just one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. That's all we are. But, but there's something to that. What that really says to me is 
we're not being transformed enough. We don't have a testimony that's alive and up to date because we're not experiencing the reality of Jesus Christ day by day. Not that we're perfect, but we should be always having a fresh experience because Jesus is real and we have something to share. Hey, let me tell you what Jesus did for me today. You know, that says more than what Jesus did to you 45 years ago, you see, or in my case, 55 years ago. Uh, let me tell you what Jesus Christ did for me today. It's reality. Christ is real to me. And I have something I'm motivated to share. And this is what John is saying. We're motivated to share with clarity and with conviction. Conviction saying, this is what happened to me and it can happen to you. And this is why Christ has, has changed me. And this is how he can also change you. Let me, let me share something. I think I have time. Um, but let me share something. A, a guy that I know, he's been in our church. He's written a lot of books. Uh, Don Whitney. He tells the story of a man who became a Christian uh, during an evangelistic emphasis in a city in the Pacific Northwest. Is that West? Uh, when he told his boss about it, his employer responded with, Hey, that's great. I'm a Christian, and I've been praying for you for years. Now, you get the picture here? Okay. Uh, it's an employer. Uh, he told his boss that he had become a Christian. And the boss said uh, to this new Christian, who was this uh, employee, the boss says, that's great, I'm a Christian, and I've been praying for you for years. But the new believer, he was crestfallen. He said, well, why didn't you ever tell me that you're a Christian? You were the very reason, he said, that I've not been interested in the gospel all of these years. Now listen, how can that be, the boss wondered. I have done my very best to live a Christian life around you. Well, that's the point, explained the employee. You live such a model life. Your, your life was such a model life without telling me that it was Christ who made the difference. See? And I convinced myself that if you could live such a good and happy life without Christ, I could too. You see, uh, St. Francis of Assisi said that um, preach the gospel wherever you go, and if necessary, use words. Now, I see the truth of that. There has to be something authentic about your life. But just like in this case, people don't always know why you're a good person, or why you seem to be content, or why you seem to have peace. They may think you just have read some positive thinking books or they may just think you educated yourself or that you have good genes and a good inheritance but they don't know that it's Christ and so eventually just like I believe Jim was sharing in the worship time there has to be some communication we have to be willing to share we have to go out of these doors and look for opportunities and listen to people and share our lives and as God gives us the opportunity say this is what Christ has done or over here at Gateway Community God is speaking to us and you can hear God speaking as well so come if you can you see it's it's communication and this is what John is doing he's he's motivating he just can't you know when you read those Gospels and you read Acts the contrast gospel silent fearful timid, un, you know, confused. Acts, powerful, motivated. They said, when they were being threatened, they said, we can't help but speak what we've seen and heard. We must obey God rather than man. I mean, they were being beaten. And they said, we can't stop it. We're motivated. We have to. We have a purpose to share Christ. To see Christ change people's lives. But you know, I want you to be encouraged. I want you to be motivated. I want, I want you to know that God will bless this congregation and this church. And he has something to do through you. And he will work through you in a great and in a mighty way. And, you know, it's not just, uh, our, our task isn't just to get people to sign up. You know, that doesn't work. Uh, I mean, we can even get people to jump through the hoops and even get baptized. The, the point is to not... Get, try to get people to heaven. It's try to get heaven into people. See, uh, I, I've seen too many uh, evangelists get people to make decisions 
and they're not really converts. They, they don't really have an experience with Christ that changes their lives. They, they, they jump through the hoops, they say the right things, but there's no difference. But John's talking about a life-changing relationship. The, the kind of motivation that says, I care about this person, and I want to see God heal their marriage. I want to see God give them joy and peace. I want to see them get out of this depression that causes suicide. I want to see them find uh, a reconciliation with people that they're alienated from. I want them to find fellowship instead of loneliness. You know, there are a lot of lonely people here in this small town. And, and people who need relationships. People who need caring. And God has given you the desire, the motivation, I hope, to, to share what you have with these who, and bring them into this wonderful fellowship. In the very last verse, he says, we write this to make our joy complete. Somebody said a, a preacher should never be happy until every lost soul has been saved. And, and that was the heart of John. He said, the only way I'm going to have full joy is knowing every lost person I know comes to Jesus. And, and think about it. Your joy, think how joyful you would be if your spouse or all your kids or your parents, whoever you know is an unbeliever, if they all came to Jesus. Joy is complete. And we have joy, and we share this joy together. And this is what he'll be talking about in this letter, this, this kind of love and fellowship that we're to share with, with one another that is part of the assurance that we truly are the children of God. Okay, when, when was I supposed to stop? When you're done. When I'm done? Well, I'm almost done. <laughs> be encouraged. I, I just want to share something with you um, that's so phenomenal. Several years ago in Chicago, you know, our sister city down the road, uh, Chicago Tribune newspaper had an intriguing front page article. It was a story about twin baby girls who'd been abandoned on a sidewalk in China. A suburban Chicago couple went to China to adopt one of these little twin girls, not knowing she had a twin sister. They named their adopted baby Mia. Now, you're already getting suspicious how this is going to turn out. The following year, a couple from Miami, Florida, way down south, they went to the same city to adopt a little girl who also had been abandoned in the same spot in front of a textile factory. One of these couples wrote about their daughter's upcoming birthday on an internet site. Boy, isn't the internet amazing. <laughs> on an internet site for parents who had adopted from the same orphanage in Yangzhou, China. And so this, there's a website for this, uh, for adoptive parents who adopt their children from that, that orphanage. After a series of emails, what these adoptive parents had suspected was later confirmed through DNA testing. These girls, who amazingly, listen, they had both been named Mia by their adoptive parents without even knowing the other had done that. From the north and the south of the United States, they were fraternal twins, separated hours after their birth. These little girls met at Chicago's O'Hare International Airport. As the parents watched these little girls dressed identically for this meeting through the parents' communication with each other, they were in awe to see these little twins after years of separation, never knowing they had a twin sister. They were in awe. To me, it's a divine thing, someone said. It's a miracle. In the sea of humanity, these kids found one another, said one of the mothers. The front page of this headline read this, separated at birth, united by chance. You know what? We are separated. And we live in a community that's separated. Um, I served a church in Brussels, Belgium for almost nine years. People from 50 different countries worshiped in that church. We were separated by our birth by where we were from, but yet we were united. We were united, but not by chance. We were united by God, who brought us together to share our lives together. And what I'm saying to you is that there are people in your families and in your sphere of influence right out here in this community who are separated, but they can become your twin brother and sister. And by the grace of God, they can be united to you. And this is the joy that you have as you see your fellowship grow. And that's what I pray for you. 
that you will be motivated, you see, to share Christ Jesus because you know what a joy this would be to see this place filled, right? Uh, maybe to see some people who've maybe wandered off because they misunderstood or their feelings were hurt or they felt neglected or whatever it was. But because of love and concern and prayer and, and compassion and, and just the conviction that you have that you want them around you. People you perhaps not, not don't even know yet, but they may be your twin sister or your twin brother in Christ as they're united in the fellowship of this church. Separated by birth, united by grace, brought into the family of God, into wonderful unity, and that will increase your joy. And I hope you'll be motivated. Motivated because you're convinced about the reality of Jesus Christ. Motivated because you're being converted by an ongoing experience with Jesus Christ that becomes more real to you every day. And now you're concerned. It's got to flow from you into the lives of others to share the message of Christ. Let's come to a time of prayer. And uh, as we pray, let's think about those that you've come to your mind right now that, that need the Lord. Maybe somebody that just drifted off recently or somebody that is, is confused, somebody that's uh, hurt and feeling a bit alienated. Maybe somebody in the workplace who doesn't know Christ and somebody perhaps that God is putting into your life that will allow you the opportunity in his time to share what Christ has done for you. So let's, let's just pray now for God to increase our motivation, increase our expectation of what he will do with motivated disciples. Father, I thank you that we can have this time of worship and we can listen to your word and hear you speak to us. Father, I thank you that uh, this fellowship of people that knows you has experienced your saving grace and now, Father, uh, desires to be motivated disciples, followers of Jesus, able to go out into the world, to this community, to share Christ with others. Father, help us to see that people really are hurting and in need of what you can do and will do in their lives. Help us to believe in your power to transform, change minds, hearts, and attitudes and behavior. I pray, Father, that you will use this church family for the glory and honor of your name. Father, speak to everybody here today. There might be one person here today who doesn't know you personally. And how I pray that that person will come to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. There may be somebody here today who's discouraged. Somebody here today who needs a new, fresh vision of your love and your grace. A new understanding that you are in this place and that you're wanting to use them in this fellowship. I pray, Father, for those here today who have joy and peace and strength, that you would now direct their motivated lives to be a part of your kingdom work and to see others come into your kingdom in this place. And this is our prayer. And all of God's people who agree in this prayer, with this prayer, would you say together, amen. Let's say together, amen. 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 God bless you. God bless you as you go. And uh, as you serve the Lord, this week, and I'll look forward to next Sunday when I guess we'll have a potluck together, and uh, that'll be a good time of fellowship. So I'll try to unhook myself <laughs> and return the uh, electronics. And uh, Jim, you can come and clean up the mess. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Roberts. Um, that's all. Just a reminder. I know you guys are all excited about that Wednesday night church cleaning. Yeah. Um, mouse stew. Moose stew. What was it? Something. Moose stew. Pork. stew. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so you are dismissed. Have a great week in the Lord, and God bless. Thank you.